Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome to yet another Lord Summary of The Beast Rises. We are now on Book 6, which means we are about halfway through. That means we're halfway to the Horus Heresy, for those interested. And uh, next week we will be having a rather special event, so keep an eye out for that. But for now, let's get on with the actual stuff, shall we? This book gives us a little more just general backstory and moving the plot around a little bit and giving us some interesting little extra information. For example, the Fist Exemplars were a rather interesting little chapter. They had been specifically designed for Void Warfare, which is an oddity. Not many chapters specifically focus on that particular aspect of warfare. Some do. Perhaps most famous would be the Space Sharks, the Kaka Shahan Hunt or whatever the hell. I don't even know how you pronounce that, but they are Space Sharks, and that is all you really need to know. But for an Imperial Fist Descendants chapter, that's fairly unusual. The Fists were never really that focused on Void War. They were decent at it, but they preferred to get their ships to do most of the talking rather than boarding parties. There were no World Eaters or Space Wolves chapter that preferred large-scale boarding actions. They'd do it, and they'd master it to the same level as all other Space Marine chapters, but it wasn't really their focus. So I'm assuming that perhaps the Fist Exemplars were taken from a slightly more aggressive part of the uh, Imperial Fists, and that does indeed seem to be backed up by several other statements. For example, they seem to hold Sigismund in a rather high esteem, and he was certainly a, oh, what shall I say, a slightly un-imperial fist, imperial fist, perhaps? We'll get to Sigismund in the Horus Heresy, but still, it's rather interesting actually, because they were also clearly designed specifically against all manners of attack by Voidborn forces, both against drop pods and boarding torpedoes with a large number of defense turrets, but the ships were also heavily protected by varying layers of psychic and runic warding, which is rather interesting. Even to the point where they had specialized psychers on board in specialized containment chambers that would constantly reapply the psychic wards and create further disturbances to anyone trying to teleport aboard the ship. Quite interesting, that. It's a, um, it's a fascinating take on Void Warfare. It was clearly, at the very least, in part also designed to counteract demons, which is rather interesting. It makes me wonder if perhaps the Fist Exemplars, being supposedly the purest of the chapters, might have originally been intended as some form of spearhead for a crusade into the Eye of Terror, perhaps? They certainly do seem like they're preparing for it an awful lot. By the way, this was not really the focus on today's episode, but it's a rather nice little note. What was really happening in the book is that they came across an Oberon-class battleship that was currently being captured and disassembled by the Orcs. Now, this is rather rare. Generally speaking, the Orcs will capture a ship and just slap shit on it. Actually disassembling and reassembling various ship components other places. Now, that is a rarity, although it would explain to at the very least to some degree where the orcs got all of the big guns for their star fortresses. Granted, it still doesn't explain where they got all of the guns for their original star fortresses, of which there were dozens. I mean, again, how the hell all of this happened without the Imperium noticing is... <laughs> quite the question, but oh well. Back on Terra, the Orc Attack Moon had been pacified, but, well, it is a new moon in orbit, and while it wasn't quite as um, disastrous as I would have imagined, I mean, if you plonk an orbital entity of that size into near orbit with Terra, you'd expect the planet to just kind of get wiped clean of life, essentially, it would be that bad. Though, granted, the simple fact that Terra doesn't have any oceans at this point might actually have saved Terra, because at the very least then they wouldn't have to worry about gargantuan tidal waves and tsunamis just cleaning out kilometers upon kilometers of coastline. Hell, probably even going many, many miles inland easily. <laughs> Oh, well, to be honest, it might as well just simply move the goddamn ocean in its entirety. So, this was actually a good thing, but nevertheless, that is of course not the only thing that happens when a planetary body simply just kind of pops into orbit like that. Tectonic activity was probably the worst thing for Terra, because Terra at this point 
is in all the essentiality a hive world, which means that you have millions of miles of giant city built upon city, built upon city, built upon city, now built upon ground that is currently moving. The hive quakes were getting to become rather catastrophic, and God only knows the body count. In all due likelihood, it would stretch easily into the millions and probably well into the billions at this point, with entire hive towers collapsing and breaking apart. In other words, the people of Terra had been saved, but they were still dying like goddamn flies. And since there were no realistic expectations of help from outside of the system, the people of Terra were pretty much left to their own devices, and seeing as their allies on Mars had just ever so recently actually bothered lifting even the tiniest finger to help anyone, the people of Terra were unlikely to be receiving anything in the ways of significant aid for a rather considerable amount of time. The raging masses were at least partially placated by a rather brilliant PR move by Curland. Curland reformed the first S.H.I.E.L.D. Corps by taking 50 Astartes from the various Descendant Chapter's first companies. Essentially, he took the cream of the crop and recreated the Imperial Fists around them. Now, again, this was... A rather big ask, to put it very bluntly, to ask an Adeptus Astartes to strike his own colours and put that of another chapter in its place is horrible. I mean, it. how could I describe it? It would be like asking a hardcore, true-believing Christian to become a Muslim, essentially. The two different chapters or religions have many things in common. I mean, it's one god and all of that nonsense. They've even got many of the same deities, prophets, you know, shit like that. But nevertheless, it is a rather jarring transition. And when you add in the simple fact that space marines tend to have a rather overdeveloped sense of honor and belonging in their chapters, in fact, many of them have been psychically indoctrinated to belong to said chapter, this was undoubtedly an extremely jarring event for many of them, and many of the successor chapters vehemently objected to this, but nevertheless, they were all talked into it because the necessity was, well, blindingly fucking obvious. The people of Terra were tearing themselves apart, and a show of strength, familiarity, and honour was necessary. The people of Terra needed to see that their wall remained strong, <laughs> despite every indication to the opposite. It was, however, not even remotely enough to head off all of the civil unrest, because, well, the proletarian crusade, which had been hyped up on every single media, radio, vox channel, etc., to be the saving moment of humanity, the, the great comeback, well, it had ended in complete and utter butchery. Which, um is a problem. There were large-scale civil uprising all across Terra, but nothing overtly military or directly dangerous towards the establishment itself. It was primarily civilian unrest, no military uprising, no garrisons taking up arms against their overlords, etc. You essentially just had large-scale demonstration, angry mobs, crashing of windows, burning, large-scale calamity. You know, the kind of shit that would absolutely goddamn cripple a city in our timeline, but for Terra would be considered a relatively minor inconvenience. And indeed, it would even be to some extent fairly routine. Large-scale civilian uprising on Hive Worlds is most definitively not a rarity, and normally the Adeptus Albites would be cracking down upon it with brutality and violence worthy of Judge Dredd's Mega City 1, except without even the pretense of justice. But, of course, there was one teensy weensy problem. The Imperial Fists had in all due essentiality been wiped out, so there was not a whole lot of help to be had from them. The Imperial Guard regiments placed on Terra had pretty much all been sent up in the Proletarian Crusade, and considerable numbers of the Adeptus Arbites had also joined in. Which means that there simply just wasn't a whole lot of troops on Terra to re-establish order. Which means that while the civilian uprisings might be relatively inconsequential at the moment, they would almost certainly grow into something considerably less comfortable fairly quickly. 
and most of the anger was of course directed towards the High Lords, though it should probably be mentioned that one particular High Lord, Justina Tull, should probably be just a little bit more worried than everyone else considering she was the architect of the grand proletarian mass slaughter. To put it simply, Terra has been saved, but it is far from saved, if you get my drift. It's still in a pretty dicey situation. But we've got a couple of other interesting mentions we should also look at. For example, we get word of Valhalla, where the angry little icemen are kicking some serious orc ass. There are very, very few planets that are able to directly resist the advance of one of the orc attack moons, but Valhalla is apparently one of them. Now, whether or not this could be the first invasion by the orcs in Valhalla, it's not entirely clear by the timeline. It seems like it might be, considering that the Valhallans described the orcs that came to their planet as a little bit more extreme than usual, so possibly, I'm not entirely sure on that. We also get a mention on the Ultramarines, who are currently, well, kinda stuck, honestly. The Ultramarines and most of their descendant chapters are stuck on the other side of the Imperium, fighting their way through hordes of orc attack moons that have overwhelmed their sectors as well. And they have now destroyed an attack moon, which brings the total up to three, which isn't great, but it's something. This is one of the points where I kind of dislike the books, because it's like, they say the entire Imperium is under attack by these things, which, considering how powerful they are, would suggest that the entire Imperium has already been goddamn overrun, but considering what happened afterwards, that clearly wasn't the case. So, how many are there? Dozens? Hundreds? Thousands? It's a bit unclear and a bit... See, it, it makes it sound like the stakes are really high without actually telling you what the stakes are, but hey. So, over to the Mechanicus. The grand experiment was successful, although not to the scale that they had wanted, and they are now searching secretly for the Orc's home world. If they are successful in this, they might just stumble across the secret to Orc teleportation technology, which is far more powerful than anything the Imperium has, and maybe even some artifacts of the old ones. Hmm. Interestingly enough. We also get further mentions of the various alliances being made throughout Imperial space, with Space Marines and Chaos Marines fighting side by side. This latest mention is of the Dreadnought Marshal Magnaric. His uh, temporary alliance with the Iron Warriors has been considerably extended due to the appearance of a gargantuan orc... well, ship. The hesitation in the title of ship comes from the fact that it is massive, said to be even bigger than the Imperial Fist's phalanx, with working engines. Not just real space, but also warp engines, which is remarkable. Essentially, it's an even bigger attack moon that is fully capable of independent movement, which is rather incredible. And this is where shit gets really interesting. One of the orcs that boarded Magnaric's ships and was slain by the defenders was bigger even than the normally ridiculously large orcs around it. And this is the odd part. The orc's armor was an amalgamation of various pieces of metal and even ceramite stripped from dead Astartes, but one of these pieces was unique in this particular menagerie of butchery. One of the sections of armor carried a set of colors that had not been seen in the Imperium since before the Heresy. It carried the colors and the insignia of the Lunar Wolves. And the last time that Legion was in combat with the Orcs was on Ulanor and the Great Triumph. It would appear that all of the Orcs on Ulanor weren't quite as dead as previously expected. Oh, and by the way, uh, the orcs can now create black fucking holes as weapons. I mean, the teleportation tech was already pretty goddamn silly, but now they have weaponized black holes. I genuinely don't even know what is next at this point. It, it feels like the books are constantly trying to one-up themselves in making the orcs more and more goddamn ridiculous. And considering we're only on book six, I'm, uh, I'm slightly scared for the future if that particular trend continues, but hey. 
Back on Terra, the High Lords were back at their usual games and nonsense. The Lord McCrag had put forth a proposal to remove the Inquisition entirely from the High Twelve. Oddly enough, Justina Tull seems to have avoided most of the criticism from the High Lords, probably because she was simply not really a threat to any of them at this point. She had no real political power, she had absolutely no public support, and all of the High Lords knew that if she tried to uh, hinder their plans, they could simply just throw her to the masses and that would pretty much be it. Nobody really had anything to lose from getting her off the High Twelve, but many of them had something to gain by keeping her on the High Twelve. The Inquisition, on the other hand, had been showing a nasty independent streak. They had, after all, contacted Curland without the approval of the High Twelve, and perhaps far more worryingly, they were getting uncomfortably cosy with the Officio. And as you can probably imagine, the Inquisition getting in bed with the Assassins would possibly be a very, very bad thing indeed for the rest of the High Lords. And this was most definitively a bud that was to be nipped nice and early. And speaking of buds, the Fist Exemplars and their new Iron Warriors friends came across a rather, um, disturbing discovery. The Orcs' massive mobilization had required them to create something most definitively un-Orky, a logistical network. A network capable of supplying the various Orc forces with ammunition and, of course, foodstuffs. And the planet upon which the Fists Exemplar and their Iron Warrior allies had landed after fleeing from the battles in space was one of these, um, agri worlds, except Instead of having a stock of corn, pigs, cows, and such on things, the main stock of this particular planet was humans. To make things even more uncomfortable, the orcs were mainly using the humans for food and skins, this be true, but they had also somehow managed to create a human auxiliary force. Now, you might be asking, why the fuck would humans fight for the orcs, but, well, think of it like this. If your only two choices are either getting turned into food, or be given a relatively privileged position within human society and be made an auxiliary, I'd probably go with being an auxiliary. Of course, that did turn out to be a rather uncomfortable little decision when the Adeptus Astartes arrived, but oh well. What is kind of confusing though is the fact that this agri world system seems to have been going on for quite a while but the orc incursion only happened months ago a year at most and yet they've established this entire system of feeding the armies and nobody noticed i mean granted imperial bureaucracy is a slow thing indeed but Come on now, a massive orc invasion on this scale, on this many planets, to give enough food to this entire massive undertaking and nobody fucking noticed? I mean, again, I, I get it. There are many systems that were not under direct Imperial supervision, and the Imperium was not as strong as it had been during the Heresy, or even just before, but really? Nobody noticed this? Because, again, this attack just happened immediately, and this is one of my biggest problems with this book series. There is no build-up. The Imperium is just suddenly in danger from dozens, if not hundreds, of Orc attack moons, and nobody has noticed this. Nobody has noticed the Orcs hoarding to a single system or an area. Nobody has noticed the Orcs hoarding equipment. I mean, the sheer amount of resources required to build one attack moon would almost certainly have drawn the Imperium's notice, but to build dozens of them, plus the escorting fleets, plus all of the other equipment they would need, plus establishing a logistical supply network, etc, etc. This must have taken hundreds of years, and nobody noticed. I mean, yes, the Imperium was undoubtedly in a lot of chaos after the heresy, but even so, that's one hell of an undertaking to keep hidden for such a ridiculous amount of time. Anyways, the planet is, however, put out of its misery. The Iron Warriors had been using this planet as a bunker world. They had a hidden storage facility on the planet, but it was a pre 
heresy facility. It had not been used during the heresy. This was proven by the simple fact that Curlin was allowed into the facility. Here's basically what happened. The Iron Warriors went away from the Imperial of Fists allies, or well, Fist Exemplar in all due technicality, that will be an important distinction to make, and entered this bunker complex. The Fist Exemplar followed, but the door was a massive blast door that would take a very, very long time to cut through. However, there was a gene reader next to the door, and when the Fist Exemplar put his hand onto it, the door opened, with a voice sounding gravelly and yet powerful. Probably Petrabo himself said, Enter, son of my brother. This quite clearly suggests that the vaults had not been upgraded since the heresy, since during the heresy wars, of course, a son of his brother Dawn would probably not have been allowed into an Iron Warrior sanctuary. Hell, the fact that they would ally of Imperial Fists in even at the most cordial times of their relationships, honestly, Kinda baffles me. The Iron Warriors and the Fists were never exactly particularly friendly towards one another. And considering what the Iron Warriors had hidden away here, I am really surprised that they would have let any Fist see it. It was, in essentiality, a planet cracker. A destruction mechanism. If activated, it would annihilate the entire planet. It would sweep it completely clear of life. The Iron Warriors were planning on detonating this device, killing all of the orcs and the pitifully humans upon the planet's surface. Some would argue that that would be a mercy at this point. Initially, the Fist's Exemplar resisted this plan, but he eventually decided to pull the trigger himself. Which, well, I think it is safe to say that at this point, the Fist's Exemplar are, for all due intents and purposes, rogue. Destroying an Imperial world without authority, at the advice of an Iron Warrior, and also killing Imperial personnel? Well, that's not something that the Imperium as a whole is going to be particularly fond of. To make things even worse, the temporary alliance with the Iron Warriors is further extended, and at this point, no real date for the ending of the alliance has been set. The Fist's Exemplar are starting to look mighty dodgy in my eyes. Luckily, the rest of the Imperial Fists are not quite as insane. Back on Terra, once again, Curland makes his move on the High Twelve and, by extension, the Senatorum. The Senatorum had been reinstated as one of the primary governing bodies of the Imperium, mostly so that the High Twelve could find someone else to shift the blame on. Because when there's this much blame to be handed out for the failure of the Proletarian Crusade, it is better to have a few more bodies around, and the Senatorum offered access to hundreds of supposed Senators with which they could share any hint of blame and catastrophe. Corlin marched into said Senatorum with the Shield Corps, and declared himself as the Lord Commander, displacing Udo, who was not particularly amused by this turn of events, even going so far as ordering the Lucifer Blacks to take Corlin into custody. But, well, Lucifer Blacks are not that stupid. And considering Curland also had support from the Adeptus Arbites, the Inquisition, the Officio, the remaining Imperial Guard forces on the planet, and of course the Astartes, Udo really didn't have a whole lot to uh, threaten Curland with at this point. And seeing this, the rest of the rats, or wait, well, High Lords, immediately abandoned the sinking HMS Udo in favour of Kurland and rallied behind his cause. This meant that Udo was essentially completely and utterly sidelined. He could not oppose the coup militarily, because, well, Kurland would put a bolt shell in his fat head, and he could not oppose it politically, because he simply did not have any support. Kurland had, in all due essentiality, seized control over the Imperium in one fell blow. It was undoubtedly a coup d'etat, but, well, it was pretty goddamn necessary, wasn't it? 
Mars' revolt is also revealed to Curland at this point by agents of the Officio. Curland immediately gives the order to deal with the Mechanicus Higher Command. Putting into action the Officio's reserve plan for dealing with just this eventuality. The Officio has also garnered themselves some interesting intelligence, amongst other things, the location of the Orc homeworld. Now, up until this point, it has been referred to directly as the Orcs homeworld, which originally suggested that it might be the world upon which the Orcs were originally created, presumably by the Old Ones. But it would appear as if the beast has arisen on Ulanor. Well, that was um, entirely expected, but hey. Though I very much so doubt that Ulanor would have been the original homeworld of the Orcs. It was never mentioned to be of particularly large strategic value other than being the centre of a orc crusade by the Emperor. Surely if it was some treasure trove of Old One technology, the Emperor wouldn't simply have had half the planet goddamn asphalted over and turned into a massive parade ground. If anything, he probably would have wanted to keep the rest of the Imperium at arm's length from Ulanor so that he could raid it for its technology and any hints that he could possibly gain, and any insight, more precisely, into the workings of the webway portals. Nevertheless, this now means that the Imperium has a target. The Beast is on Ulanor, and seeing as his forces are currently attacking pretty much the entire goddamn Imperium at once, a classical decapitation maneuver seems to be called for. But that will have to wait until the next book. Until then, I have been Arch. Thank you very much for listening, and I do hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.